Derek Chauvin's guilty verdict has amplified the call for criminal justice reform. Activists are now looking ahead to several upcoming trials. This includes former Brooklyn Center Police Officer Kim Potter, who fatally shot Dante Wright during a traffic stop. Many will look to see if the Chauvin trial will influence Potter's case. Joining me now for more is John Powell. He is a professor of law, African-American studies, and ethics studies at the University of California, Berkeley. He's also the co-editor of Plessy v. Ferguson and the Legacy of Separate but Equal after 125 years. Professor Powell, welcome. It's great to have you with us. Are barriers to police reform written into our legal system? And do you believe that Chauvin's verdict could potentially change that? Well, thanks for having me, first of all. And the reforms are not prohibited for the most part. I mean, the things like qualified immunity, but most of it is culture and society is divided. So Richard Nixon found out and every essentially president since then, presidential candidate, that law and order actually collect votes and especially collect votes among those who give so the wealthy, white. Um, and so we really have two different societies, if you will, multiple societies. Um, and so the police and politicians generally are more beholden to those who give money and to the white middle class than they are to communities of color in the black community. So let's talk a little bit about the impact this has on black families. Of course, for both George Floyd and Dante Wright were fathers as well as sons, uh, uncles, and brothers. How have police shootings affected not only the victims, but black families witnessing the fallout? Well, there's a great deal of research showing that anytime there is a killing of an unarmed black person, uh, the immediate community actually goes through trauma. Uh, immediate, immediate black community. It doesn't have, generally have the same effect on the white community, uh, but it has a profound effect on the black community that lasts for several months. And as you get closer to the family, the more profound that effect. Uh, a colleague of mine at Ohio State uh, did research on that and looked at the families and the communities and it destabilizes both the families and the communities for years into the future. And so the, the, the harm is done is not just to the victim or the victim's immediate family, but to the larger community. Uh, and especially again, the black community. And one thing to remember, think about something like Black Lives Matter. There are unfortunately deaths in all communities, but the white community doesn't complain for the most part that when someone was shot because of their race, they weren't shot because they're white. That's the central complaint in the black community. But the person's not just being killed or shot, it's because of their race, or their race contributed to the death. And uh, Professor Powell, several states are now looking for ways to punish protesters fighting for black lives by passing some strict bills. Oklahoma, Florida, and Utah are just some of the states introducing legislation offering protection to drivers who hit protesters. What does this pushback signal to the black community? And is there reason to believe that this is at all reminiscent to the 1960s civil rights movements? Well, I think unfortunately it is. I mean, um, as, as the country tries to grapple with becoming a country where everyone's uh, life and uh, everyone's aspirations is treated equally, particularly the black community, there's a pushback. We saw it after the Civil War and the Reconstruction. And there was a huge pushback that it took the country almost 60 years to begin to recover from. So, and that's what the Plessis Ferguson uh, Journal is about. And then we saw the Civil Rights Movement and we watched the South, which was deeply aligned under the Democratic Party because Lincoln was Republican, realign behind the Republican Party. And a lot of that was about race. It's like, if you're gonna extend the right of blacks to vote, you say we're not allowed to vote generally in the South, uh, fair housing, uh, we're not on board. And so they pull the Republican Party to the right, not to conservative right, to the racial right. Um, and the Republican Party has been, been going there ever since. And Trump accelerated that. And what you see now is that in the Republican states, as we sort of teeter, not just in terms of racial justice, but our very democracy, people are rushing to actually undermine our democracy. The idea of protest, the idea of free speech is the bedrock of democracy. 
And to have governors and cities actually rush to limit those uh, at a time that we have a country trying to grapple with these issues is really disheartening. And it's consistent with people coming out with laws banning the vote or making the vote harder. After every court looking at it said, there's no substantial voter fraud. And so what is the specific moment calling for, Professor Powell? Because many are pointing to this sort of opportunity that exists in the wake of the Derek Chauvin guilty verdict as one that needs to be seized upon to sort of push forward on some of these reforms. So what do you think needs to happen, you know, in the, the immediate future to ensure the movement for criminal reform keeps moving forward? I think that's a really important question. And the reform that's being required or being asked for, first of all, is different than in the past. So if you look at Ferguson, there were a lot of protests in Ferguson, not as many after the killing of um, George Floyd, but there were a lot of protests. But the protesters were overwhelmingly black. Uh, and the unfortunate thing in America is that, um, for the most part, white America and established America don't really listen to blacks. They have different stories about blacks. And one of the things about George Floyd's killing that was so telling is that we have that video. The video was eight minutes, 40 something seconds. The time that Chauvin was on his neck was closer to 10 minutes, but you could see it. And everyone was at home because of the pandemic. And so the protest in terms of George Floyd's killing was much more multiracial. Uh, and you saw for the first time, a large number of white Americans, a large number of established Americans, a large number of corporations, and even police officers themselves saying something's wrong. We've never had that in this country on the issue of policing. So we're at this inflection point. Generally support for the police is in the high 70s. Uh, and so can we actually now cash in on this? Uh, sometimes our attention span is very short. Um, and I think there's a, a we just did a survey showing that the vast majority of Americans believe in reform. They don't necessarily support defunding the police, but they believe in reform. So I think if we can sort of pull people together and come up with things that for all of us are safe, this should be about public safety. This shouldn't be about black and white. This should be an American issue. But unfortunately, there's some people who would trade on the division. There were some people who would trade on, on hostility. Uh, and those people too often are in power. Well, Professor John Powell of UC Berkeley, thank you so much for joining us. We certainly appreciate your perspective and insight. Thanks for having me.